So Strauss is the chairman and CEO of Take-Two Interactive Software, hugely important uh, video game publisher, and he's managing partner of Zelnik Media, which he founded in 2001, which is an investment company that invests in media and entertainment primarily, mm -hmm. is that right? He was previously president and CEO of BMG Entertainment and president and CEO of 20th Century Fox, he's board chairman of ITN Networks, and the director of Starward Property Group. Um, so we're gonna, I wanna talk about your career a little bit because over your career, we're talking about video games in the context of entertainment and storytelling. But what's interesting is that you came to this after having worked in television, film, your uh, production company produced uh, Dirty Dancing, is that right? First movie company, yeah. The first movie company, <clears throat> um, which I imagine pretty much everyone in this room has seen. Um, it was actually the first picture I greenlit. Really? Yeah, so it was sort of beginner's luck. How was your record after that? Uh, Initially not so good, and then yeah. quite good. It got better, yeah. okay. So it must be hard to follow Dirty Dancing. It, it? For me, it turned out to be exceedingly hard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, film, television, and, uh, and music also you're involved. You oversaw BMG's North American music? Worldwide. Music. Worldwide, yeah. okay. So now you're in video games. I want to ask you, how, how did you get into the video game industry, and how does that, you know, how does that connect? Well, I, um, <clears throat> my initial ambition had been to run a movie studio, and I, that happened for me much more quickly than I anticipated. At age, what? My first one at 29, and the, a major studio at 32. Yeah. And I did, so by the time, I, I thought I wouldn't be running a movie studio until I was this age. <clears throat> so after doing it for seven years and having made 150 movies, I sort of turned my attention to what I thought would be um, I'd want to do from then, I decided I wanted to run a diversified media company that would en encompass other areas of media and entertainment. And <clears throat> through a stroke of um, luck, in the, in the traditional entertainment business, um, the person who's least capable is the one they assign new media to. It should be the other way around, but that's what they do. So when I got to Columbia Pictures right out of grad school, I was working in the television business. They needed someone to look after the new media business, so they handed it to me. In those days, new media was video cassette distribution, and I'm not kidding, that's what it was. So I, I had, um, I, I became the new media person and I became very comfortable with that notion. Um, so I was involved with sort of being a, a proselyte for new media and entertainment a very long time ago. <clears throat> and so when I was at Fox, I also was responsible for new media. And when I turned my attention to doing something different than the movie business, I thought, wow, you know, the video game business looks a lot like the movie business, only with much better economics. Why don't I look at that? And so I actually um, joined my first video game company a, a really long time ago in 1993. Mm. That was Crystal Dynamics. So it was it was intentional. Yeah. Um, and what you just said <clears throat> that the, the economics of it looked much better. And we're going to talk about that more later. But just um, can you can you explain that a little bit from the outside? Why did the video game industry look so attractive? It 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 did and it does um, primarily because they're both very risky businesses. But in the motion picture business, you spend a lot of money making a movie. You have some sense of how it's going to turn out, but not really until you're pretty fully committed. And then you have to spend a great deal of money to market it. And you really, in the, unless it's a, a sequel with the same director and the same cast, you really don't know how it's going to perform until it opens on a Friday night. And um, you really don't know how it's going to perform. Uh, in the case of a, a major video game title, while we spend a great deal of money and we spend a lot of money to market it, because we sell to retail initially, um, we have a pretty good sense of how it's going to perform. And also, we have a, the structure of the business is when you sell the goods to retail, they can't return them. It's a one-way sale. It's not mm -hmm. a consignment sale. So retail effectively is a bit of your risk partner wow. if you're good at what you do. Now, if you're bad at what you do, all you have to do is have a couple of bad titles. Retail's not going to accept the title. You won't be able to have that relationship. But to the extent you have a good track record, it meaningfully reduces the risk profile of any incremental release. Um, so that, that, and that's an enormous difference. Yeah. So the movie business would be a really great business except for the risk part of the business. Yeah. Um, so if you could take a business like that and reduce the risk profile of the business, it's a much better business. And that's the nature of the video game business. And what's interesting, just while we're on this point, what's interesting is that the video game business in some ways is, is bigger than the, the, by some measure. Yeah, it is. In aggregate, it's a bigger, certainly bigger than the theatrical. In aggregate, I suspect all um, uses of motion pictures still a bigger business, but they're both very large. You know, 
tens of billions of dollars uh, businesses uh, worldwide mm. at the wholesale level. Do you, we talked about this a little bit, but do you have a theory about how video games fits in this continuity of entertainment, a kind of macro? <clears throat> from a consumer point of view or a business point of view? Both. So from a consumer point of view, <clears throat> sorry, um, I would argue that a video game is still a different experience than other forms of entertainment and therefore that it's very compelling to some audiences and not for all audiences because it is, it is by its nature interactive. I think people who have posited that all movies will become interactive have been wrong and I don't believe that. Um, people have posited that video games will become cinematic. You know, I, I, I'm one of those people. I do believe in mm -hmm. that. But I think an interactive experience is different than a linear experience, and I think both forms of entertainment can exist. What's great about technology is it, it created an ability to have this very high-quality audio-visual interactive experience, which we couldn't have, for example, when I was a kid. So a high-quality audio-visual experience when I was a kid was a linear experience. That yeah. was the full extent of what was available. Today, if you wanted to have a, an interactive experience, it, it wasn't audio-visual. It was more physical. Go outside and play a game. Or play chess, play a board game. Today, technology allows us to create a high-quality interactive audiovisual experience, but it doesn't eliminate other forms of entertainment. It sits beside it. And is gameplay the distinguishing thing that sets video game apart from, uh, <clears throat> from, other, from movies and other forms of entertainment? For sure. Yeah. You know, it's, it is that gameplay that makes it nonlinear and makes it a different kind of experience. And the people who've forgotten that have made some pretty interesting video games, but they don't perform as well as video games that have gameplay in them. And that includes us, by the way. So, well, we're, well we're, for example, um, L.A. Noir and Bioshock, both great games, both mm -hmm. the big hits for us, but both were more story-driven than game-driven, mm -hmm. and the biggest, our biggest hits have been the best of both. Mm -hmm. So what, so what, you've had incredible hits, Grand Theft Auto is the franchise that probably stands out the most, Grand Theft Auto V, which came out in the fall. I think had a faster, is the fastest. Fastest entertainment property ever to sell a billion dollars worth of product. And it's now sold 33 million units. Yeah. So average 60 plus dollars a unit. So you're talking about billions of dollars of sales. And you said the fastest entertainment property and obviously video games. So that's across movies, everything else. Everything. Okay, including video games. So what makes a great video game? You know, um, <clears throat> Well, I worked for Barry Diller in the movie business, and if you asked him what made a great movie, and I did, because I, I asked him a whole lot of questions, um, his answer was a good story well told. Um, what makes a great game is easy to play, difficult to master. Mm -hmm. And that's true of any game. So if, uh, you know, a problem with chess, and the reason chess isn't a widely distributed game is it's difficult to master, it's not easy to approach. Mm -hmm. um, Squash is a great game because it's easy to approach, difficult to master. Mm -hmm. Checkers isn't a great game because it's easy to approach and easy to master. So easy to approach, difficult to master is the formula for any great game. What does it cost you to produce a game? Lots so and lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> we don't actually uh, you know, give the figures out, but yeah. it costs as much as a major motion picture yeah. to make and to market. So, so, so I think some analysts estimate, <clears throat> um, if you can't say... Tell them not if it's, we're in the right range. <laughs> Wing. $100 million roughly to produce a, a serious game and $50 million to market it. it, it for some of us, that could be true. I suspect yeah. some people have spent a bit more. Many, many people spend less. This new generation of machines um, may allow people actually to spend less, mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out, because it's somewhat easier to program for multiple systems now than it was. Um, but it's obviously a very expensive endeavor. So you're not far off. Can you, it's 100 million and 50 million in markets, we're not. But we're that's not, not an average. That, yeah. that would be higher. That would than be the high end. Okay. That would, no, that would be a very high end game for, 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 the, for the industry. So, so there are a bunch of players who are producing these big high end games, but they're, they're, there's a range of games we should probably talk for a minute about. What we're talking about are console <laughs> games, which people pay $60 for they either download them or they go to a retailer and they get, they get the game uh, from there. Um, how do you see the industry, uh, and both from a consumer and a business standpoint, across these different types of games from Angry Birds to Grand Theft Auto? Well, it's, it's actually not a spectrum. So yeah. the, the audience, of, how many people here play big console type video games like Grand Theft Auto? 
a pretty small part of the audience and skewing to the younger side of the audience. Yeah. How many, and the male, I think mostly male, how many people here have played um, Angry Birds? Right. Much bigger part of the audience, more females, and this, and this demographic here is more middle-aged or older than middle-aged. So they're very different markets and they typically don't cross. If you play Grand Theft Auto, you're probably not playing Angry Birds. You're almost certainly not. You might, you might play Flappy Bird, but probably not Angry Birds. Um, and what's been great about the launch of smartphone games and tablet games is it's expanded this notion of interactive entertainment to a very broad segment of our population. But they are different things mm. in the same way that, you know, eating candy is different than eating steak. You know. And do you, um, do you, how do you think about those platforms? Um, so your games are on these high-end consoles, but they're also available on tablets and other devices. As well. Some of them are. Right now, tablets yeah. aren't powerful enough to handle our newest games. We have put out some of our older games on, on tablet quite successfully. I'm a big believer that tablets are going to become very, very powerful, as powerful as a PC. Um, if I turn out to be right about that, and I don't think it's much of a stretch to believe that, then there'd be no reason we wouldn't make any games available that we make available for PC, available for tablet. We're ecumenical about platforms, and I think a lot of people ask, I'm going to you know, skip ahead and save you the trouble of asking me what I think of Go mobile, <laughs> because you know, a lot of people talk about mobile games, and from our point of view, the issue is not whether you're connected by a wire. And mobile isn't the issue. The issue is screen size, small, medium, large and processing power, you know, light, moderate, and heavy. And typically a smartphone is, you know, small screen, light power, a console is big screen, high power, and a tablet or a PC, you know, mid-size screen, mid to high power. And the game experience tracks that, light, medium, heavy. And I think we'll be able to move the heavy experience to a medium-sized screen, but only when the processing power is there. In the same way that in my household, it's probably be interesting to know if it's true for anyone else. <clears throat> so we, we have like um, one of these very um, expensive projection television set, setups in the, play, the kids' playroom, which is about 10 yards from the master bedroom because I live in Manhattan. And um, <laughs> we used to, uh, you know, that used to be where we watched movies. And now my wife watches a movie on her iPad with Bose headphones in bed even though it's 10 yards from the room that has the pro projection screen to anyone nodding, right? And why is that? I don't know. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, except that it's a good viewing experience. It's a good sound experience. She's comfortable. Um, and so I think you'll see the same thing with video games. Even though it's going to be a tablet, it'll be a smaller screen than a big screen. Mm. For some people, that'll be a good place, you know, a good way to use it. From our point of view as a company, and I think largely as an industry, we're ecumenical, right? We want to be where the consumer is. We don't, we don't want to vote where we don't have to vote. It's interesting that you're so bullish on tablets, though, because there are a number of skeptics about the growth in tablets. I, uh, Apple's iPad sales are kind of flattening off. And if you look at the media consumption growth, it's all mobile. The tablet share of media consumption has, has more or less stayed constant over the last uh, year or so. Tablets have to become more powerful. To, to, I mean, in my opinion, tablets will become lighter, smarter, faster and cheaper yeah. and there are certain uses they won't be good for so I have you know I have a smartphone in my pocket that's never you know not putting a tablet in my pocket it doesn't matter how light it is mm. um, and they'll be flexible too probably still won't put it in my pocket to make to make phone calls with um, but I do think tablets will be ubiquitous and the few of you who are who care enough to write notes today probably be making notes on tablets within a couple of years mm -hmm. I just want to on that note I want to say that we are going to take questions before the end. So if there's anything you want to react to or ask about, please, um, please note it down and we'll get, uh, uh, we'll get to you about that. So you've, you said before, I think, that success is about uh, consistency. But at the same time, your, your industry, industrial success, your business success relies on creativity, <clears throat> imagination, storytelling, things that are probably less predictable. How do you, how do you manage that? Um. I'm trying to try to do this and, you know, without it being sort of how, I, you know, the answer to the question, you know, how awesome I am. <laughs> um, <clears throat> look, I, I'm really, you know, I'm blessed. I've had this 30-year career in all forms of entertainment. Yeah. And I've, and I've usually done turnarounds. So I've usually taken a company that was performing very badly and, and brought it to great performance with, with a team of people to do that. And I've done it in television, home entertainment, um, video games, 
music and motion pictures. Um, and more than once in most instances. So Take-Two is my third video game company, for example. Um, and yet, I've never made a video game. I don't know how to program. I've never made a movie myself. Um, I've never, I've, no, I've produced one song. Um, What's the I, song? <laughs> it was a Carly Simon track on a Jim Brickman album, very really? arcane. Yeah, it just ended. What was the track? Uh, it's Mockingbird on it, but it was a, she did a remake of Mockingbird for Jim Brickman That's as a, good, a favor to good me. classic. Yeah, but I'm, that, that was not where we were going with this, and it wasn't okay. a hit. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but I've had, I've been blessed with hits, enormous amounts of hits. Uh, and so what do I attribute that to? Because I couldn't, I'm, I'm, I love all things creative and I embrace creativity, but I am known, um, I am what is known in Hollywood as a suit, despite the way I'm dressed today. And suits are, you know, based, a suit is a derogatory, der, you know, a derogatory uh, term in Hollywood, to be clear. Uh, it's, not, it's not said with affection. Hmm. I learned to embrace my inner suitness early on. Um, <laughs> And it worked really well for me. What, what I have done as a suit is I have a massive amount of respect and admiration and appreciation for creative people. And I seem to have the ability to distinguish between truly talented creative people and people who are less talented. I, that, that I'll give myself credit for. And then I move heaven and earth to attract those people to my companies, to give them a safe place to work, to provide enormous financial resources, never to be a pain in the ass, or almost never, to get out of their way and to encourage them to pursue their passions. And um, that seems to be a recipe for creating hits. So in 30 years, I've never lost a creative talent from any of my companies. Um, I've almost never fought with creative talent. I have occasionally. Um, I hate it, but I have. Very, very rarely. And if you, if you got someone alone, um, you know, a creative person who works at one of my enterprises, an hour in the past and asked what it was like to work with me now, if they could remember me. Um, and I'm not, the suit. and I'm exactly, I'm not yeah. necessarily kidding by the way, um, because really suits are pretty fungible. Um, but what they would say if you got them out of your shot and you could promise them confidentiality is, um, you know, uh, yes, that guy basically, you know, all suits are horrible and all corporations are horrible. And as suits go and horrible corporations go, that guy did a really good job of creating an atmosphere where we were able to do our best work. That would be the honest answer to the question. And believe it or not, that distinguishes me from most other executives in the business because most people in my business really lead with their egos mm -hmm. and they really, really want to be out front. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the people I tried to learn from was long gone, was Steve Ross. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Steve Ross used to say, you know, you know, he could get anything done if he was prepared not to be, you know, in front, in front of line. And I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, I'm getting the, the quote wrong, who said, you know, as long as you don't care about getting the credit, you can achieve anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I try really hard to do is to <clears throat> encourage creative people to pursue their passions. And what that also means, and this is, a, I get criticized for this too. I don't have the ability to say to someone, <clears throat> could you deliver this next week? Could you do this precisely at this budget? Could you, I really am frustrated that you haven't delivered this yet. You know, we have a release window in July and you're late. I don't have the, I lose the ability to say that because what I'm saying is pursue your passions. I will give you the resources mm -hmm. to do it. But what I found is over time, if I'm willing to live with the frustrations and I'm willing to put my ego totally to the side, and I really, really mean totally to the side, we get great results over and over and over again. So when I took over Take Two, Take-Two was in very tough shape. The company had $700 million in revenue. It was losing money. It was heading directly you know, into a very bad place, if not bankruptcy. And they had one product that was a hit, Grand Theft Auto, that the company put out every four or five years, and they would make a lot of money in those years and then lose and blow all that money in the other years. But that was just the state of play. Um, today, seven years later, Take-Two has launched more than seven massive global hit franchises, one every year. Um, this most recent year, revenues were about two and a half billion dollars. We made about half a billion dollars. We have billion dollars in the balance sheet. We effectively have no debt because our debt is convertible debt into equity. We count for it as though it's equity. Um, and we have the most important collection of intellectual property in the interactive entertainment business by our standards or our competitors' mm -hmm. standards. Um, we were the, you know, the ugly stepchild of the industry. Um, you know, today we're the number three company in the industry, coming from way, way, way behind. Um, and that was done by, 
you know, a team of a couple thousand creative people. We have 1,900 people in 15 studios around the world. I didn't do any of that work, but I moved heaven and earth to create a safe place where they could do that work. So it's interesting as you just said that you, get, you lose control through this management stuff, not being up front. Yeah, you lose a bit of control. But you're also the CEO of a public company that has investors who expect you to show up every quarter and deliver financial results that they're, that they're looking for. Is, there, is, that a, is that harrowing or is that a... Is, it sounds like that would be a tense, frustrating... Um, sort of high wire act. No, we're talking about business here. I have three children. That's a tense, frustrating high wire <laughs> act. Um, no, I mean, look, part of it is that we're honest. I mean, if you, you the street does encourage you to, to paint beautiful pictures. And if you take that bait, then yes, it's a, a harrowing experience because you are playing catch up every quarter. And that's how you turn into an Enron, right? You, you start believing your own nonsense and your ego gets inflated and everyone in the team is getting rich and your stock price is high flying and you have to deliver every quarter and now and then, of course, you fall short and then you feel embarrassed and then you start moving things around. Next thing you know, you're a criminal. Yeah. Um, so we don't do any of the above. We don't come close to the line. We stay way on the other side of the line. We under-promise and over-deliver. We do it over and over again. So we've, I think we've over-delivered um, against our guidance 28 out of the last 30 quarters. And I'm not saying we always will. We intend to guide accurately, but we don't, we don't, you know, we don't think pipe dreams. We think realistically. That said, it's a volatile business. And one thing I say to all my investors is, look, we're a pure play entertainment company. There's a lot of volatility baked in. Now and then we're going to be disappointed. Hopefully now and then we'll be delighted. Can you, can you talk just for a minute about the production of a video game? Because I'm not sure that people understand sort of what you start <clears throat> and you say, we're going to do Grand Theft Auto 6. How many years ahead does that happen? What, do you, what is the process of actually mobilizing the team? It's a massive project. How many continents involved? Just Can you give us a window into, into what that looks like? Let me talk more generally as opposed yeah. to about Grand Theft Auto because uh, you know, I wouldn't talk about any one of our enterprises that yeah. way. But we have one or more studios that are all in different geographical locations, which would have a minimum of, say, 50 or 70 people and as many as 900 people or 1,000 people in one. And the typically a small group, if not one person, conceives of an idea. If it's new IP or a sequel, um, they get their broad agreement. Um, then the, the corporation gets on board, which is uh, you know, based on a quarterly review process where we actually do assess how much something will cost to make in market and how much we think we can make from it. We are a commercial enterprise after all. And then that team, um, in the same way that a motion picture is produced, led by one to three individuals at the top, will create a team that's going to work on that property for a number of years, and they block out what it looks like, and then they begin to program. And in the case of a motion picture, you write a script, and you shoot the script, and then there's post-production and music and the like, and you have mm -hmm. finished movie. In the case of a video game, it's largely you know, programming, people sitting in front of computers. Not entirely, I and mean, there's some stuff that's that's shot. So we, for example, we we actually shoot people's faces and then we mm -hmm. create computer versions of those faces for many of our titles, for our basketball title, for example, for our wrestling title. Um, <clears throat> but generally speaking, the work is done in front of computers. So people ask for like, can I have a studio tour? And I'm like, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's like a whole bunch of people sitting in front of computers. It's not yeah. super exciting. Really high-end computers, though, probably. Yeah, they look like computers. Okay. <laughs> how many people, on a, on a big, serious video game, how many people are involved? You, hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. Yeah. And your studios are, you said in different places, are you, are you working outside of the U.S.? Like, yes, you, we're all over the world. China, Canada, the typical places? Yeah, we have places. a couple hundred people in China. We have uh, people in Canada, uh, Czech Republic, the U.K., Scotland, um, Australia, what Quincy Mass. It, Quincy Mass? Um, why Quincy Mass? I have no idea. I can't okay. stand Quincy Mass. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> um, anyone from Quincy Mass here? <laughs> How do you feel about Quincy Mass? <laughs> really not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what about where, in ter let's look ahead in terms of where video games are going a little bit. Um, you, what are you most excited about in terms of Technology, business, um, storytelling, developments—like what are what are the 
I'm always most excited about what's coming next. So yeah. we have a, a property called Evolve that just won, won a bunch. You're giving me an opportunity to promote the hell out of my company. So I I'll, promise I'll, I'll stop anytime I'll you, you stop story. asking. Yeah. But I, we do have a title called Evolve that anyone here a video game player who's heard of? Yeah, Evolve. Are you excited about Evolve? Yes. Are you? Yeah. I can't play it. Why? Because I can't connect parts one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Separate topic. Um, so, and, and it'll be on PS4 as well. It'll be on PC as well. So Evolve is going to be a, a one to four game. So one person plays a monster, four people play hunters. And that, that's a very unusual sort of game mechanic. Mm. So we're really excited about it. Just won a bunch of awards. We think it's going to be a massive hit. It, anyone's guess if it is, but I'm really, really excited about it. I'm very excited about how Grand Theft Auto Online is performing. That's a, a multiplayer game that stems from Grand Theft Auto V. That's turned out to continue to delight people well after the initial release. For those of you who are, you know, sort of shaking their heads like, what is he talking about? You know, we used to put out a video game that was like a movie, you know. It was a complete round experience. We put it out, you played the experience, you were done. Grand Theft Auto Online is an online experience that persists where you can continue to play and you can play with other people in a persistent, continuous world. And um, Grand Theft Auto V was put out months and months ago and people are still playing Grand Theft Auto Online now. And that's really exciting. What about, you, you talked about this earlier a little bit, um, but what about more lifelike, high-def video games? So one thing that we're seeing in um, coming into our homes eventually is these 4K high-def television sets that Netflix and other people are really excited about. Haven't um, you noticed it makes movies look worse, not better? 4K does? I mean, high-def, yeah. just general. It's like it ruined the movie experience in my household. They, all movies now look like soap operas used to look, remember? It's, yeah. Hasn't been a good thing yet. I guess we'll all get so used to it. So you're not excited about people it. People say, you know, yeah, I am excited about it for a different reason than that. You know, resolution isn't always a good thing. So, for example, we have a title called Border Borderlands, which doesn't take advantage of high resolution. It's actually a comic book experience. So remember, what we do is not just business, it's art. Yeah. And they're all different forms of art. Some art wants to look very realistic. Some art wants to look very abstract. That's true for video games as well. It's true for movies. That's why you see animated movies. Mm. I don't think that'll change. I do think technology is going to push the envelope on both sides. So will we have the ability to make a video game that is totally interactive, that looks exactly like live action? Yes. Is that going to be a little creepy for some of us? Yes. Yeah. But will it happen? Absolutely. Right now, our sports games, if you move back about four feet from the television, you look at someone playing our NBA title, and you squint a little bit, it looks like a basketball game already. And we're nowhere near you know, the asymptote of where we're going to get. Well, one of the specific areas of technology development, there's, this, there's Oculus Rift, this company that Facebook bought, and there are other 3D sort of immersive goggle experiences. That um, haven't been launched yet. To they, be clear, they're still in development. They, they are. But are you, is that an area that you're focused on? We're not only, be, not for lack of interest, but only because until we know what it really is going to look like and how we can make games that work with it, there's not much for us to do. But we're very excited about, I, someone pulled a soundbite out of the air that said I was a skeptic. I'm not at all a skeptic. Our team is incredibly excited about both Morpheus and Oculus Rift. It's just that without the final expression of what the device is and can do, we just don't you know, we don't have a point of view about how it'll matter to us. But if I had to guess, I would say it probably will matter to us. Mm. What about, um, there's a big technology company that has massive distribution network that just launched a device relatively recently that has video games as one of its primary intended uses, and, and that's Amazon with the Amazon Fire I thought you were going to make me guess. <laughs> <laughs> what was your guess? Oh, yeah. um, anyway. Yeah, so it's Amazon uh, with Fire TV. How do, do you see them becoming a big player? They're, they're obviously a kingmaker and an incredible power in publishing and, and retail. Mm -hmm. Is video games an area where you think um, they're going to they're gonna have that sort of power? I hope so. It will expand the market for us. Really? I wouldn't count them out. Jeff Bezos is really talented and he seems to be very ambitious. And, and you're so. not worried about the pricing model for two reasons. One, because um, a lot of the games on those consoles are $3 games and... Uh, the other reason is that Amazon exerts a, um, the pricing power that a company that has zero ambitions for profit margins can exert. That's an issue if they're your only distribution partner, but I don't think there's much evidence that that'll be the case. Yeah. You know, I don't think that Amazon's goal is to knock out Sony, Microsoft, and all the PCs, and Steam, and everyone else. But even if it were, I don't think it's a realistic goal. That's very different than what they found when they found the book business yeah. some time ago. Um, 
So I, I don't think it'd be realistic all to believe you could corner the market in interactive entertainment distribution. Um, obviously, if they could, that would be a problem for anyone who produced. I'm not really worried about price points because it is true that certain platforms aren't going to work for certain of our products. Um, smartphones don't work for our products. That's okay. I do think if you give people premium experience, then they're going to come out for it. And, you know, that happens to us over and over again. Hmm. That does mean, though, for example, if people get accustomed to paying a maximum of $10 for something on a tablet, we couldn't put a frontline release on a tablet. That's okay, but it would mean we just couldn't do that. We'd have to change our business model. Do you have any... But if that's the business model that consumers want, <clears throat> we have to adjust to that. Consumers don't... They're not in the business of adjusting to us. I, I loved being asked when I was in the movie business. People would say to me, why do you make this terrible crap? You should make really great uplifting stuff because, you know, you force people to watch this horrible, terrible, exploitive stuff. And I said, if I could force anyone to watch anything, my life would be so much easier. Yeah. And then we think about it, but it's not that way at all. We, we try to give consumers what they want. Um, so I want to I uh, hit that point a little bit. Um, and there are two aspects to it. One is... Um, you mentioned chess a few times earlier, and I think there, there are some people who are concerned with uh, the amount of time that kids spend playing video games on screens, kind of generally when they're not playing chess and they're not playing outside, like you mentioned. Does the industry have any responsibilities around that, or should, should parents, grandparents be concerned? We, have, we absolutely have responsibility. Anytime you're, if you want to be in the hit-driven business, you, are, you have a social compact, right? You're, you are in the business of being involved with people in a very emotionally meaningful way. Um, when, when, when the company I worked at, Vestron, made Dirty Dancing, you know, within two minutes of making that, you know, young women were all dressing like Jennifer Grey for a while in, in Dirty Dancing. We do affect, we have an influence on the cultural vernacular, and we take that responsibility really, really seriously. Um, do we create behavior? Absolutely not. Um, of any sort, you know, good, bad, or indifferent behavior. But are we part of the conversation? We absolutely are. So we have a social responsibility. And because I have been in all media businesses and because I'm fortunate that I get to control what I do, um, I personally take responsibility for those choices. So the, everything that we put out at one of my companies has my personal stamp of approval and I stand behind it. Mm -hmm. And there aren't a lot of people who like to say that, particularly when they do edgy things, and we do very edgy things, but it happens to be true. Um, and no, we will not do just anything. You know, there are plenty of things that we will not do. So let's talk about Grand Theft Auto, which is one of the edgier <clears throat> things that, that you do. It has a, it's rated M, I think, which it is. Is, means that only uh, people 17 years or older are supposed to be buying it, at least. The reality is that parents and other people buy it. Kids have, kids have access uh, to it. What do you, how, how do you think about, and, and the reason that Parents, some parents are concerned about this, is that there is, there's a fair amount of swearing, there's violence, there's drug use, there's strip clubs, I think, in Grand Theft Auto V. I haven't I encountered so. myself. <laughs> um, so how do you, how do you take response? And, and there are some researchers who have said that, the, you know, in teenagers in particular, um, exposure to violent video games and that sort of thing uh, heightens aggression and diminishes empathy in teenagers. Does that concern you? It would concern me if it were true. Yeah. But it's not true. And that's a, I mean, it's a, it's a, the it's strip a, clubs in Grand Theft Auto? No, the second the, point, the, second the, the strip clubs exist. Um, yeah. Actually, I don't know that there are strip clubs in Grand Theft Auto 5. There may be. But uh, that's, that's not the point. The, 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 the urban legend that entertainment affects behavior um, is just that hundreds of people have tried to prove the point and uh, no one's been able to. The Supreme Court took it on two years ago and examined all the research and arrived at the conclusion that there was zero connection, again, good, bad, or indifferent, between any form of entertainment and any form of behavior. If you need a, a better, more evidence, because it's such a hot topic, usually, oddly, in election years, um, but it is such a hot topic. You know, the same entertainment is consumed worldwide, particularly in English-speaking countries. So the United States and Canada, for example, <clears throat> now, how many people in here are Canadian? because Canadians say excellent. They're very similar countries. I'm married to a Canadian. They hate when you say things like that. But they are very, <laughs> very similar, and they're very similar culturally, and the same entertainment is distributed. Um, the same access uh, uh, you know, exists. 
So in the U.S. in the last 12 months, anyone who has to guess roughly how many incidents of gun-related violence were there, roughly, in the U.S. in the last 12 months? About 11,000. Anyone has to guess how many there were in Canada, roughly? Fewer than 200. Is there any difference between Canada and the U.S.? Yeah, the prevalence of guns, exceedingly different. The prevalence of entertainment, not different at all. The type of people who consume entertainment, exactly the same. The demographics, exactly the same. So, and also, frankly, it stands to reason. Just think about it, common sense-wise. Um, if, if, if entertainment, you know, forget video games for the moment. You know, how about dramatic television shows that are on television after 9 o'clock at night, which are live action, our video games are animated. <clears throat> so they're intended to look real. They are really rough. I mean, they're really, really rough. There's a rating system, but they're really rough. If, that, if entertainment could really influence violent behavior, wouldn't we see a whole lot more of it? Than, we have horrific levels of it, but we do have 300 million people in this country. Wouldn't we see a whole lot more of it? Said another way, take a violent person and give them you know, um, children's storybooks to read. They're probably going to still be violent people. And there's a lot of evidence that they are. And take a person who's not violent. For example, I'm not a violent person at all. And you know, deprive me of sleep and food and water. You know, put me in solitary confinement. Do that for a couple of days. Take me out. Make me really angry and hand me a loaded gun. I'm still not going to shoot you. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So, and we know that it's not going to happen. We know that's just anecdotally the case. So I know as a matter of both research and common sense that entertainment doesn't create behavior. I'm not worried about that. But that doesn't mean I, I resist taking responsibility for what I do. I do. And there are plenty of things I won't do because it's inappropriate, because it's not a message I want to send, because it's not a cultural conversation I want to be part of, because it offends me. Mm -hmm. And if my sensibilities are offended, we don't do it. But, if, but at the end of the day, we're in the business of making art. And art can be and often should be very rough, very edgy. It should push the envelopes. Uh, and I like to be part of that within reason. And I really, really, really mean within reason. I had a great experience. When I, you know, this, by the way, the conversation evolves. So <clears throat> my grandparents, my grandparents' parents were very upset about jazz music really upset about jazz music. If you go back and read it at the time, they were every bit as upset about jazz music. My parents' parents were really upset about rock and roll music. Mm -hmm. And um, parents today are upset about video, video games, some parents. Yeah. The good news is we have a rating system that the ESA is, uh, SRB has put in place. 90% of parents use that video game rating system. It's more than any other entertainment rating system. 90% of retailers use it. That's more than any other entertainment business uses it. So we take responsibility for what we do. We market to adults. When my friends say to me, oh, you make Grand Theft Auto, I'd love, you know, I'd love it if you'd send me a copy for my kid. I'd say, I will say, to be clear, it's not intended for your kid. It's intended for audiences 17 and above. And I believe that. If a parent buys it and gives it to their child, that at that point is a parental responsibility. And I am not interested in getting involved in that mm -hmm. relationship or, or, or having a point of view about it. So we're going to take questions in just a minute, um, but I want to, before we do, I want to ask you about television just briefly. It feels to me like we're in a moment of a kind of resurgence of television. Television has been liberated in some ways because of online series and other things from the actual television, the original television networks, but it feels sort of culturally that television style video is, is um, kind of merging a bigger part of our, of our conversations. Do you, do you see that also? And how totally do you, agree. Okay. So 10 years ago, if you went to a dinner party, no one was talking about a TV show. They were talking about movies. If yeah. They were talking about entertainment. Today, they're talking about television shows. And they're binge-watching television shows. Completely changed. I attribute it to the fact that we have all these different options that are, have been created by digital technology so that you know, um, Netflix can create television shows. Uh, and you know, there are many different outlets now that can effectively create and distribute television shows. And, and bring them to people, and what's the result been? More availability of higher quality product. It's just another example of what digital technology can do. It increases availability, it increases choice, it seems to increase quality. How does it play out, do you think, in terms of the, the traditional networks, cable, uh, the, the sort of the locus of power around distribution and entertainment? It's, it's, so it's just opened up everything. It used to be, when I started in the TV business, we had three people to talk to, three networks. They were the gatekeepers. Today they're just 
way fewer gatekeepers. Or sorry, way more gatekeepers and the gates are lower. Still, very expensive to make a TV show, very expensive to market it, very risky. Don't get me wrong. Mm. But you can go about it a different way. In those days, if you couldn't sell a show to ABC, NBC, or CBS, you were not in the television business. Now there are a lot of other choices. Okay, we're going we're gonna to take questions. Walter, you get the first one. Thanks. Um, first of all, well, um, let me protect my old friend, Ben Franklin, who was the one in Poor Richard's Almanac, who first said, uh, if you don't care about getting the credit, it's amazing what you can accomplish. Thank you for that. That's I right. I didn't even, I was, the good news is I didn't say Winston Churchill, so yeah, I'm yeah. in good time. <laughs> Thank you. I got nothing against Abe Lincoln, but we hmm. need to give Dr. Franklin. That is right? true. Ever since uh, technologies have uh, come along from you know, Gutenberg's printing press, helping to create a novel, we've created whole new forms of media as technology made a great leap. Uh, you're at the forefront of that, whether it's a cinematic thing like L.A. Noir or uh, Grand Track Auto that's very interactive. But do you see a whole new form of media that might emerge that perhaps could be, you know, a collaborative storytelling or LARPs that are done uh, so that it's um, we're not still in the era where we're putting plays on TV by pointing a camera at them and inventing something totally different, perhaps collaborative creativity or some wickified storytelling, or I, I don't know what it would be. It's very, um, very tempting simply to say yes, because who, who knows what's possible. But I do think that storytelling by its nature is a creator telling a story, if you look at the beginning of time. And we had the ability, technology enabled collaborative storytelling a long time. We used to play a game at summer camp where someone would you know, tell a bit of a story and then a horror story, and someone would tell the next part and the next part until it got scatological, which usually <laughs> happened very quickly. Um, and, but collaborative storytelling, the problem with it is that storytelling relies on this, you know, this veil, the suspension of disbelief. And as soon as you're part of it, you can't suspend disbelief. That's a, wrong, that's a problem with having, remember there for a while those movies you could vote on the ending? As soon as you can vote on the ending, it ruins the movie. Because you are in the movie. You believe that it's real. You know it's not real, but you believe that it's real. You want to know how the story ends. Otherwise, why would we cry at movies? So I don't think collaborative storytelling works, even though technology will enable it. One of the things I like to say is that one of the ways that you can tell if a new medium is going to work is if it creates a new kind of human behavior, the bar is very, very high. If it enables existing human behavior, the bar is pretty low. Um, storytelling always existed. Games always existed. So radio, television, motion pictures, this all makes sense. Um, you know, sending people communications, well, that was a bit of a stretch. Sure, we talked to people, but sending a letter, that was a stretch. Email, maybe a bit of a stretch. Um, other forms of communication that should naturally stem, like, you know, video chat, seems to be very awkward for us. I'm not sure why it's been technologically available for 40 years. Um, so, but generally speaking, pre-existing forms of behavior are what technology enables and becomes successful. So collaborative storytelling, I'm skeptical about broadly, you know, other forms of media that have been created by technology, absolutely. You know, and I can't wait. I hope I'll be around for them. In the back? Uh, yes, quick question. Um, so you've got these great games like L.A. Noir and Max Payne probably most people in the audience haven't played them, and yet probably a lot of people in the audience have watched L.A. Confidential or Maltese Falcon. And I guess the question then is, you talked about making your games easy to approach but hard to master. Why do you think your company or your industry doesn't put in, for lack of a better description, a grandpa mode where you know those of us that are less uh, ch uh, sophisticated than our teenagers could actually get into the games far enough to, to enjoy them? Thank you. It's a great question. The problem is that the people who are good enough to make games all play games and they love the elegance of doing things that are harder and harder and harder and it's really hard to encourage people to do that because I'm not a, game, I'm not a gamer. Everyone who works with me knows that so it's not a secret. I have the same exact pro I have the same grandpa problem. Um, and we have tried to do it with some of our games. We try to make it easier to approach and I would say it's something we need to work on more. It's a great question. Absolutely a great question. Hello, yes, um, my name is Brian Delaney, I'm a playwright and screenwriter and I've just come from the Shakespeare session and I was just sort of thinking, you know, as well as the technology storytelling <coughs> session yesterday, what medium would Shakespeare be working in if he was working today? And I think that, you know, all these new technologies provide, you know, one can imagine maybe the fully immersive storytelling in the future 
where you're actually embodied with holograms, etc. You know, it's the imagination kind of runs wild to think about it. But I think that gaming is a, a fascinating area for for writers nowadays. You know, in terms of the size of the audiences that can be reached. I'd just love you to speak a little bit to how you work with writers. I know there are game designers and script writers, but if you could just talk maybe a little bit how you work with your storytellers. Well, remember, I don't. I mean, I don't actually work with them myself, right? Well, I try to encourage to to bring on board the very best people, and we do. For example, Dan Hauser. Uh, is a is a writer who writes most, if not all, the dialogue for our Grand Theft Auto games. He's extraordinarily talented, and his job is so much harder in many ways than you know we, what I thought of as a scriptwriter because he writes ten thousand lines of dialogue, and you know it's remarkable um, what our writers have to do. So the answer is um, in a very different way than film and television and, and plays do, and we're still finding our sea legs. One of the things that's different is virtually all of our creative people work inside our enterprise on the payroll. And most other creative businesses, they're independent, as you know, but in video games, are still inside. So it's still pretty insular business, small group of people. I'd like to see it expand more, but right now it's still very small. By the way, I just saw Kenneth Brown and um, Macbeth at the Armory in New York to talk about sort of a different view of an interactive Macbeth. There's nothing quite like being inside a battle scene and getting rained on. I actually got rained on, so it was great. <laughs> right over here. Yes, what about, if not collaborative storytelling, what about collaborative problem solving that could bring sort of science and humanity together so that all these sophisticated people playing the games could be playing to sort of solve a science problem or solve you know, a bigger issue than stealing an automobile or whatever. It, it, it happens all the time. It's not what we do for a living. Right. Uh, no disrespect meant. I, you know, meant I, you know, I'm not in the business of curing cancer. I bring people light entertainment. Right. You know, I'm proud of what I do, but I understand what it is. Uh, but that kind of crowdsourcing technological <laughs> solutions to the world's problems does exist. There are various prizes that have been given out for that. And there are numerous, right now, numerous crowdsource competitions going on to solve technical problems. Are you part of this new higher education video alliance that was kind of launched on Tuesday? Very much so, because I'm chairman of the Entertainment Software oh, okay. Association. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very much a part of it. I take no credit for it, but I'm very much a part of it. I'm thrilled that we're doing it. Yes. Right here. Hey, so it sounds like maybe I should have been at that session because my question is that you've spoken really well about sort of how you manage the social responsibility that comes with creating the kinds of games that you create. But I'd like to know how, what your thought process is around the opportunity that comes with that, right? So on the other side of just saying yes, People, only people older than 17 should play these games. But we do know that on the flip side, like a lot of us in a session yesterday learned, for instance, that like if you teach people about healthcare on a television show, they'll make more responsible decisions around their healthcare. So what are you guys doing or where's your responsibility lie in terms of like getting good stuff done with these games? It's great. I mean, we do that as part of the ESA. So for example, the ESA helped launch the Glass Labs program, which has brought so far two games, a NASA collaboration and an EA collaboration on Sims into the classroom, which helps kids play games and learn at the same time. So there are plenty of opportunities to do that. And you know, our daily bread is making art that is commercial and making money and doing it. We take some of those proceeds and actively support endeavors of the ESA and others to make sure that we do good at the same time. I think there might be one thing that would get you and I into video games. And it is this fabulous new understanding that the brain is terribly elastic. So the neurosurgeons are teaching us over and over to get that brain moving. And I would think an interactive video game would be sort of state of the art of pushing my brain into uh, untraveled territories. Is that likely? There's actually research that that's the case. So for example, I think fighter pilots who played video games as a kid um, are, are much more likely to be good fighter pilots. And it stands to reason. I mean, all the, all the activities, your eyes are moving quickly, your hands are moving quickly, your reaction time has to be quick. Um, and I agree with you, the brain is extraordinarily elastic and playing games does appear to be good for us to, as we try to, try, uh, um, to stay young, which is hard. Exactly. <laughs> well, but the, the traditional approach that has been Sudoku and things like that are not that are not fully immersive video games? I think you know, it's the grandpa question before. We have to make them more approachable. Okay. 
So I had a question. A recent trend among video game manufacturers has been the use of microtransactions within games. In other words, mm -hmm. not only are you paying for the title, but also in the middle of the game experience, you're uh, purchasing certain upgrades or whatever. Do you envision this as being a rising trend in the industry, um, either with your titles or others? And uh, do you think that has any sort of effects on the gaming experience, which might not be sort of consistent with um, how video games have evolved? In a way, you've given me the answer with the question, which is only to the extent it enhances the experience. So are we prepared to pay for something that gives us more value than what we pay? Yeah, that's the definition of a transaction. Do we like to be taxed over and over again when we do something? No. Do we specifically like to be taxed when we're trying to be entertained? Really no. But if we give people a good experience and then we say, now this experience can continue and here's another opportunity to enhance it if you pay a small amount of money, what we found is consumers appreciate that. So we do that in our basketball game. We do that in Grand Theft Auto Online. But we make, take enormous, enormous pains to make sure that it delights consumers and we really listen to their feedback. It is absolutely the case that if you overdo it and you start creating toll booths on the entertainment highway, you know, you're going to get criticized and you're going to lose your customer. And our job is to delight our customer. That's how we, uh, you know, that's how we create value. We have time for maybe two more questions, two or three. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Can, can you um, talk wait, about wait, your wait, customer? Wait. Um, <laughs> we just need to get it on the camera. Oh, okay. Can you talk a little bit about customer feedback and whether you use traditional or use your video games to, to get feedback and how that works? We do market research all along the way. Um, you can't really research an idea. You don't get a good, you don't get, people don't give you good answers if you try to research an idea. You can't increase your hit ratio through research, but as you're getting close to the completion of a title, you can optimize it and polish it based on research. People will say, I don't like this part of it, I do. And we can also measure, when we have testers, hundreds of people who test our games, we can measure when they lose attention. You're right, And then we can say, oh, we did something wrong here. We can tune the experience up, and we do. We also begin to get awards, or we don't get awards. We get, as we did on Evolve, we've gotten a bunch of awards. We get uh, magazine covers. Uh, we get a lot of PR attention, or we don't. And that happens six to 12 months before a release. So that will give us an opportunity to say, are we getting something wrong? Are we doing something right? Over here. Um, are you interested in hemispherical storytelling since Oculus Now is going to be a trend? Uh, the answer is I'm not sure it'll change storytelling. I do think it can change graphics, but it remains to be seen, and we have to see Oculus and Morpheus in their commercial forms to know. Uh, so uh, Rockstar has an unusual, the creative of Grand Theft Auto has an unusual degree of autonomy vis-a-vis um, -vis -vis its parent, Take Two. Um, which is very unusual in corporate America, where normally um, all, all subsidiaries uh, have uh, an, an oath of fealty to the parent. Could you explain, I mean, it's, it's, while it's mirrored in Activision Blizzard's re uh, relationship, it's still unusual in corporate America. And could you explain how that, the history and dynamics of that? I don't think, Gary, I don't think it is unusual. I think if you look at the history of, you know, the old Bell Labs, um, they were specifically independent and they did basic research. Um, and if you want great basic research, your lab better be pretty independent. If you want great creative properties, your creative people better feel every day like they're creative entrepreneurs. Um, at the end of the day, all of our people at all of Zelnick Media's enterprises know where they work and they understand the deal. Um, someone said to me, an analyst said to me, not in a particularly friendly way, you know, um, something to the effect of, you know, how do you deal with this, you know, when you don't control the situation? And I said, no, no, no. I, I do control the situation. There's no doubt about that. I'm the chief executive. And by that, I mean I take responsibility for the situation. But controlling a situation and yelling at people or controlling a situation and telling people what to do, these are very different things, right? You know, everyone knows I have the gun in the drawer. I don't have to ever take it out of the drawer. If I do take it out of the drawer, I do so at my peril. I might be the one to get shot. So the answer is, no, I, I think we set a model. I hope we set a model for how you create great performance, and not just among our creative people, among our business people as well. You know, my colleagues don't feel as though, I don't wake up in the morning with an agenda of telling people what to do. Matt, I got, I don't know, group, I have five or 7,000 employees. I'd be a very busy guy. You know, I, people, you know, I bring on board the most talented people. I encourage them to pursue what their creative passion is and their business passion is. I expect A plus performance, and it's my job to know what's going on. But beyond that, you know, it's a pretty rare day 
that I wake up and start barking orders. I mean, things have to be seriously out of order. And if that were the case, that too would have been my responsibility and, and my fault. One last question. Did you have a question back there? Yeah. <clears throat> the man in need of an Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need one. Um, I just have a question about the fact that people buy these games and then they can record it and put it on YouTube. Do you think that social media is going to be a way for people to maybe go deeper? I don't know if I can ask that. It's a good question. I mean, we were, we were and, and are still an investor in Twitch, which is an experience where we actually can witness people playing video games competitively. Um, I do think there is an experience beyond video games. In the same way, you know, people said initially, who would ever want to watch people play poker on television? Guess what? People watch yeah. people play poker on television. Um, I do think that, the, the, that video games are such an important part of our culture now that watching people play them or watching what they've done can be very compelling and interesting. And, you know, it's just one of the many exciting things I get to do every day. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Strauss. Mm.